Hello, everyone, and welcome in today's nursing webinar session. Myself, Shanti Bhattacharya, the Vice President of Nursing, Yashoda Hospital. And today we are going to discuss about one of the very interesting topic on polytrauma, its initial assessment, two case study, and one review of journal. Having said so, as we all know, every one out of 10 people die in road missions. And every 1.89 minutes, there is a trauma-related injuries, which is happening on the roads, and a lot of mortality rate, which is uh, currently persisting. But also, there is a lot of orthopedic advancement specialties are evolving in practice. So let's see what we have in today's webinar session. Having said so, let me uh, introduce and welcome are very eminent, highly competent, and very skilled a surgeon, none other, Dr. Kirti. And uh, sir, specialties are into the robotics. He himself is a very, uh, is a very, uh, you know, eminent arthroscopic surgeon and uh, minimally invasive trauma specialist. He also operates on foot and ankle and knee and shoulder sports medicine specialty. Specialist, sir, I welcome you. Today, even I welcome my uh, nurse manager, who is Pushpa, who is a nurse manager for medical surgical ward at Haita Keshoda Hospital. I welcome both of you. And today we are going to talk about the polytrauma. And let us begin the session. Uh, the first overview to Dr. Kirti only. Uh, sir, to tell us more about polytrauma, as you are one of the a uh, very eminent polytrauma specialist. As for you, what could be the national statistics of uh, polytrauma as you witness every day and do the intervention? Hello, everyone. When we talk about polytrauma, it's not just fractures what we talk about. It can be an uh, blunt injury. You don't see a drop of blood, but patient comes to you in hypotension or loss of consciousness and all those things. So we should be very closely monitoring. And as per the data, if you take, most of the polytrauma cases will be reported to the hospitals somewhere between three to six or in the early hours, wherein most of us will be lousy in our sleep mode. That is where we are supposed to be very attentive and address the need of the heart. In it, very, we should be on the toes. That is how we take the call on. Seeing a patient, without a drop of blood, no significant injury, always be cautious and more be more cautious in examining and looking into the things. And coming back to the stats of number of cases you get, if you talk about simple trauma versus polytrauma, it may be like less than 1%, but that matters a lot. When you talk about the mortality and morbidity, like dysfunctionality or functional outcome, what we give to the patient and away from the work, being away from the work in a polytrauma is comparatively more compared to a single, simple uh, trauma patients and all those things. And most of the times we even, we overlook at the abdominal injuries or we overlook at the chest trauma and all. This is how we should precisely have a protocol. And as we discussed earlier, even we shouldn't mind having an polytrauma code kind of a thing, wherein you have a stroke, stroke code or blue code for cardiac and all. Even for a polytrauma, all the necessity departments should be given a protocol kind of a thing. And even we should have a code so that even one overlooks or one misses the thing, the other one is looking at it. That is how we, it's a teamwork. Basically, polytrauma is a teamwork rather than being a single specialty thing. That is how we look into the things. Yeah, having uh, your great input on the national statistics. Uh, thank you, sir. And. Uh... Pushpa, you can begin with the rest of the session. Kindly share your slides as well. Go to the next slide. Okay. 
Yes, very good evening, everyone. This is Pushpa, and I'm very thankful to the Yashoda Hospital for giving me this great opportunity. Today, we are going to discuss about the polytrauma. I'll just go with the definition. When an injured victim has sustained multiple injuries, like major limb injuries, associated head injury, abdominal, pelvic injury may cause significant disability and may be life-threatening, known as polytrauma. And as just, I would like to go for the, the WHO trauma statistics. Motor vehicle continues to be a major developmental issue of public health, public health concern, and the leading cause of death and injury in the world. At least one out of 10 people killed on road across the world in from India, according to the World Health Organization. It is indeed a matter of great concern during the year 2021. A total number of 4,12,432 road accidents have been reported in the country, claiming 1,53,972 lives and causing injuries to 3,84,448 persons. Unfortunately, the worst affected age group in road accidents is 18 to 45 years which accounts of about 67% of total accident deaths. The majority of fatal road ac traffic accidents victims are pedestrians, two-wheeler riders, bicyclists, and four-wheelers as well. Over to Shantika. So um, how many, to Kithi sir, how many injured victims uh, uh, you assess are the real polytrauma cases and uh, how bad initially they are as per your assessment? That's all depends on uh, the kind of injury. Most of the times they're all open injuries, what we call, wherein the bone is exposed or uh, there's a significant uh, blood loss, might be some vascular injury kind of a thing, or there is a bleed within the abdominal cavities, wherein you, there's no external bleed, but there's a significant drop in the blood, uh, blood value yes. and uh, they'll be in hypo, and suddenly they collapse, all of a sudden. They come to you, they come into the OP, all conscious and all. And within no time, like in 30, 40 minutes, they start collapsing and immediately we need to address the things. That is how it would be. Calling up to the number, it all depends on what zone you are working in, what kind of places. More towards the national highways and all, you'll be seeing these kind of injuries to be more. And as it has been elaborated, it's more of a road traffic accidents what has been elaborated. Definitely the percentage of road traffic accidents are more. Yes. Unlike the road traffic accidents, there is another main entity what we commonly see would be the construction zones, yes. especially the high rises wherein you see they fall from the height or something That's like that. Right. These kind of an patients, they come to us very in a very bad shape. Even them, we need to concentrate and even they should take prophylactic measures like wherever they are doing these kind of things, uh, immediate first aid measures to be taken care of. Uh, most of the national highways and all, they have that NHA ambulances and all. Even the similar way, a protocol should be found uh, near to the construction uh, sites or the high-rise people. And even we should, we, as in uh, social responsibility, we should start giving some initiative uh, training programs to them as well as to their main working uh, group what to be done, how to take care of the primary uh, initial, uh, what we call first aid part. And if required, how do you stabilize? How do, what, what to do and what not to do is what we, we are supposed to teach them. That is what we look into. And most of these, especially from fall from height and all, they come with an abdominal and spinal injuries. So they are to be more uh, precisely to be looked into, especially the uh, even right from the way they, the way they shift to the hospital also, it has to be monitored. Nowadays, we have these airlift and all those things which we are catering to few uh, few of the patients. But as such, when compared to the UK or the Australian stats, it's much, yes. much, much less in India. The beginning of the treatment for a polytrauma patient because of the logistics and the stats what we have. Uh, for the population, what we are having and the, for the kind of care what we are being given, that's one of the best. But if we can improvise on that, that will be even better. Over to you, Pushpa. And uh, I request uh, a little loud because I think weather is uh, very bad outside. So thank you. Please carry on. Yes, ma'am. Right. So let's see into the etiology. Motor vehicle crash 
RTA, unhelmeted motorcycle or bicycle crash, falls from heights, blast, airplane crash, thermal, chemical injury. And recently we have seen the train derailment in Balasu district. It is an eastern state of Orissa where 280 people are dead and 900 injured victims were found. And let's see the risk factors. There may be a low GCS score, systolic BP less than 80 mm of HG, pneumothorax, thoracic and pelvic intra-abdominal bleeding, airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, hemothorax, open thoracic injury or, and frail chest, massive internal and external hemorrhage, et cetera. So here, we, uh, we nurses, when we uh, confront these uh, um, multi-trauma, multi-system injuries, and we get to see, I mean, we do not know that the patient has been received with a flail chest. But it is only the clinical uh, team when who they come and diagnose. So what what why this uh, flail chest injuries uh, you know it happens and what immediate interventions are drawn done from your end and what should be the role of the nurses when we see uh, any anticipated chest injuries uh, cases at ER. Sir, to you. This is to me. Yes, sir. So basically, uh, anyone with a chest injury, rather than only clinically, once we put on with the, as we suggested earlier, low GCS, patient being drowsy, not arousable, and BP being on the lower side, the main significant thing would be the saturation. Any saturation, any uh, bleed from the nose or mouth, it might there might be aspiration, and they might have. You should anticipate these kind of things if you are finding any in the nose, there is a high probability that there isn't chest injury or even otherwise also, the blood might have been gone into the aspiration kind of thing might have happened. And because of that also, you need something to be addressed into. Especially in when there's a pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax and hemonemothorax and all those things. First thing, what they do in a pneumothorax would be, you have to puncture that tension, whatever you're having there. So, in the centers like ours, you have every consultant, as I told you, multi-department involvement would be there, and especially for the polytrauma, especially when it comes to the chest, lung and chest, you have a thoracic surgeon, you have the pulmonologist to take a call. Right away from the casualty patient moves into the CT, and by the time he comes out of the CT, you know what is happening there, and by the time he is out, there's no delay in the time, or there's no delay in taking a decision kind of a thing. That is how it goes. And especially when it comes with the abdominal injuries also, if you require an immediate intervention, within an hour or two, patient can be wheeled into the theater. That is how the facilities have been made up of. When it comes to the thorax part, putting an ICD, at what time it has to be put? Is it an immediate requirement or it can withhold on the things? It all depends on how bad is the chest, patient is becoming drowsy or not. Even in certain cases, we're in like a 50-50, like you can do it or you can still wait kind of a thing. In a polytrauma, there's no harm in putting an ICD unless there is an, uh, like by doing a suction or putting an ICD or creating a negative pressure and you're damaging the lung further. Unless that is the only contraindication what you have. Otherwise, you can just put off the ICD and uh, clear the things and keep monitoring the things closely. And uh, the thoracic surgeon will be taking care of the part as well as the pulmonologist look after the things. Thank you. And mainly we need to address the infective part also. Like it's not like day one, uh, stabilizing the patient is not the only challenge what we have in polytrauma. Preventing the infections to happen, especially the chest injuries and all, yes. the lung infections, pneumonias and all, uh, they end up in the multi-organ failure kind of a thing. Preventing them is also a bigger challenge for the next uh, couple of days or a couple of weeks, whatever we need to face the challenges. Based on that, we have to take uh, utmost care in these things also. Over to you, Bish. Yes, thank you, sir. What is damage control orthopedics we see now? DCO consisted of the provisional immobilization of a long bone, mainly femur, fractures in order to achieve the advantages of early treatment and to minimize the risk of complications such as major pain, fat embolism, clotting, pathological inflammatory response, etc. So the basic objectives of the damage control is to prevention, minimization, restoration. So here, sir, um, 
I am I am I'm very thankful that this uh, damage control uh, orthopedic scenario and uh, you know the the PPT preparation while pre preparing the PPT you have uh, said me to you know highlight on this because we as a nurses so we are uh, you know we follow the trauma pathways and uh, initial assessment at ER but uh, the concept of uh, DCO is a little new for us now and how do we go about it means what are the concepts are these the primary parameters in uh, DCO a basic thing in damage control orthopedics is two things here one is uh, minimizing the blood loss the first important thing is minimize the blood loss minimize the chances on or the requirement of the transfusion and stabilize the things once we stabilize most of the complications are set aside like we can prevent uh, embolisms we can prevent prevent certain infections kind of a thing wherein we immediately stabilize certain things and also the abc is taken taken uh, care of when we talk about this damage control orthopedics and whatever we do even uh, there's a blood loss uh, transfusing the blood and there's unstable bony fracture there or unstable pelvic fracture or any abdominal injury or something like that which has happened unless you sort out where is the, where there is a leak unless you stop the leak whatever you put in is going to tap out from there so to pre prevent that and minimize the requirement for the transfusions and the transfusion acquired reactions something called the trolley and all those things to prevent them these things have come into surface uh, in damage control orthopedics it's not like these are the things which are done in a patient who are critically ill wherein we can't do a definitive procedure for them because they're not stable. They're still on the risk of life. In them, to prevent the further damage, this is done. This is like a stabilization procedure, not a definitive procedure. Wherein you're putting the X-fixers or in certain cases, you're putting the splints, even putting a slab for a multiple fracture and immobilizing them. Even that comes under the damage control orthopedics. It's not just the external fixator what we put. And in these scenarios, it will be done just right in the ER. In the ER itself, if required, we'll be putting off the X-fix if you have an all the four long bones fracture both the femur both the tibias kind of a thing wherein both the lower limbs are uh, floating you can't mobilize the patient even for the ct or whatever tests you want to do whenever you keep mobilizing him it keeps on mo moving you are injuring the soft tissue structures around it there'll be high chances for the embolism to happen all these things so in them you stabilize them with an external fixators even putting a pelvic binder itself is a stabilizing part what we do so this is how it goes. Even before going to the primary investigations, if you suspect any unstable pattern, so something like and you have an injury in the cervical spine, rather than shifting him and pro, uh, going into the CT or the MR kind of a thing, let him go with a brace to the neck. Brace, yeah. brace what we put there. That itself is then further damage control. That is by definition itself is preventing the further damage itself is a damage control. Risk. By definition is that. So the simplest thing that is being done to prevent any further damage itself is a damage control orthopedics when it comes to the bony parts. Pushpa, you can share the slide of, uh, yeah. So um, we were just going through the pathophysiology. One has to really understand the pathophysiology of any disease condition. And uh, uh, the first hit could be the road traffic accident or any mishaps, which is, uh, which, uh, victim has confronted and I think the reaction towards the same and the resolution, what is the second hit and uh, or the patient uh, shifts it to MODS or ARDS uh, condition? Uh, this we would like to understand from you because this is a little difficult for us to uh, you know, understand the flow of second hit. What is the second hit? The commonest thing, what we commonly see, especially in the femur fractures or any multi polytrauma, where the patient is immobilized, embolisms. Because the first state, you are taking about the volume loss, you're checking it, uh, transfusion and all, you're checking, correcting it and all. The second thing is, after even the hemodynamically being stabilized, there will be a response, the immune response, whatever you have in the body, there will be some chemical pathways which will be going on. Even that will cause some reactions within the body. That will lead out to the secondary trauma kind of a thing. Even doing a surgery, which is not an optimal timing, even that itself causes a second hit. So that is the reason why we have to check all the parameters. For example, a simple femur fracture comes to you. 
we are not talking about, you know, about then polytrauma. A femur fracture who is already in a saturation drop, whose pulse rate is on the higher side, whose BP is dropping, you always suspect fat embolism. Even though even your uh, CT pulmonary angio shows to be normal, it might be still an uh, evolving kind of a thing. So in those scenarios wherein it's not a mandate thing to be operated, right? because when you want to nail or do something, by nailing, you are again releasing the fat over there. The marrow is released and you're giving a second hit there. So these things are to be very closely monitored even before, because we have seen patients being lost with a fat embolism also. So overlooking these things can also lead on to certain things. And many a times, DVDs, especially when long bones are operated and they have been rested for a quite a long time, like three to four weeks or something like that. Any suspicion, always double check with the Dopplers and then start mobilizing. And these days we are being on the prophylaxis of um, these anti-platelets kind of, I think the Xeraltos and all those, the blood thinners what we use commonly, that we are being uh, using as a prophylaxis for a, almost all the polytraumas, the joint replacements, even to an extent of, uh, even when the patient is being mobilized, like something like an ACL or something like that, where we never used to, use and prophylaxis in them. The anti or DVT prophylaxis, we never used to use that. But post-COVID, we have been seeing a few patients who have, who have come up with an uh, DVTs, established DVTs after even an ACL reconstruction, which is a purely elective thing. So in them also, we have modified the things and we have started putting them on uh, DVT prophylaxis, even though they are being mobilized, we have started putting them on them so that the second line of the things are being uh, challenged and controlled. And any uh, reactions those are happening, can it be the immune response or whatever it is, we should be, be prepared for them to be settled and then multi like involvement of uh, the pulmonologist or the physicians, all these things are to be looked into. And secondary infections like pneumonias, all these things are to be taken care of. That is what we are supposed to do. So I think it is very important for the bedside nurses to always reconcile uh, the patient's uh, DVT uh, prophylaxis uh, injectables and as, her, as you said, early ambulation is the prevention yeah. for. More than that, first primary as a nurse, the back care. That is what we, we always, that's been old time teaching. Everyone talks about the back care. Patient care has to be given. There's no alternative. And if someone tells I have developed a bed sore when I'm in the hospital, it's the curse. It's our Lacunae, not the patient's lacunae. Okay. So being under your care, if someone is developing a bed sore, we should take care of that Why it is happening. Patients would be in pain. They won't be cooperative. Even then, you know the advantages of these things to be taken care of. So primary back care or prevention of the bed sores or any pressure area source, like it can be at the ankle, at the back or scapula, wherever the patient is immobile for longer hours, Putting them on alpha bed or an air bed doesn't mean that everything is done. We have to keep checking as our old timers, like every fourth hour or sixth hour, we keep mobilizing them, put water to the back and all those things. Secondly, most of us are missing out on the monitoring the urinary or output source. It's not like we send our juniors there, ask them to check what is the output, come back and whatever they say, we write it down. What is the input versus in, uh, output ratio has to be very closely monitored, especially in these kind of a patients, because they can't overload them also with the fluids, because most of them would be on the fluids and they can't overload them. And it also gives you the idea about the, about the kidney functionality and all those things. If you find any one simple uh, decrease output per hour, you can you need not check your BP again. You can always have that in the back of the mind that. There, there are chances that he is going into hypotension. There are chances that he is going into renal failure. There are chances that he is going into multi-organ failure. Do not check every parameter. One parameter of decreased urine output per hour itself suggests there are multiple things being happening there. And we very cautiously monitor the saturations also. Uh, it might be normal. You send your junior there, look after the SL 95, 92 and all. It's not just like you put off the probe and whatever first reading you get, that is not the reading. You just wait for a 30 seconds at least, look into that, and then see the reading there, which is persistent. Once the pulse is stable, the reading, what you get there is the true reading. So look into it, make sure that the readings are normal. Even if the reading is a bit lower, so don't panic, 
ask them to take a deeper breach. And if you feel it's less than 90, saturation of SPO2 of less than 90 and all, just connect them to the oxygen and inform your consultant as well as the required uh, staff over there. You don't panic over there. And when the, whenever the patient is becoming drowsy or whenever the patient is feel this is not really looking good, and make sure that he's being shifted to the ICU wherein uh, there's a very close monitoring kind of a thing, even if it is doubtful thing, rather than taking uh, the things lighter on the lighter note, like let us wait and see what will happen for the next half an hour. Rather than that, there's nothing wrong in doing the things pro proactively. So that is how things are ma to be managed. And that's how we have to look into the things uh, when you are talking about the tertiary or the quaternary care. Pushpa, second, sir. So this is, uh, I think, uh, sir has already properly very well explained that uh, the result of the second hit and the stabilization process for the same. Next. I think these algorithms also, I think the ETC stands for again early total care and uh, whether the patient is stable, then shift to OR, otherwise uh, shift to ICU for the better care, I think. Yes, sir. That's what it is all about. Yes. Next. It's all about what you want to evaluate, how you want to evaluate, and uh, what are the necessary investigations to be done, yes. and all these things. And uh, I think they are not, uh, ABG has been mentioned. So, ABG is one of the yes. clearest things that can be done. And uh, it, it is one of the difficult things that you, you should have practice on this because patients will be in uh, hypotension. It's not easy to palpate the pulses and pulse. Yeah. You take the help of your ER uh, friends. Yeah. Uh, if required with under the guidance of uh, ultrasound, you have all the equipments over there under the guidance of the ultrasound or something like that. Puncture the artery properly and one go, get the things done. That is how we should look into it. Next. So these are the phases of damage control surgery. This is also a new thing for us, like phase one, what happens, phase two, and phase three. Uh, I think, uh, sir, you must be following this protocol for our well, That's what the early stabilization and what have been discussed in elaborate till now, like yeah. uh, removing the source of the leakage. Yes. That is the primary thing. And life saving procedure, something like uh, someone has a solid organ injury, uh, who has a ruptured spleen or a ruptured blower, bowel in the abdomen or any lung injury. The primary care will be given initially, long bone primary stabilizations would be done. Pelvis, any stabilizers are required that will be done. And definitely with the polytrauma and all these things, he'll be in the ICU. That is the second phase. Once the patient is completely stabilized, we have gone through that phase of being hemodynamically unstable, any source of infection, and uh, monitoring all the parameters with the cardia, renal parameters, all the main five organs, whatever you're having. Uh, be, they being normal, then the final phase of corrections and all this comes. They all fall back in the regular way, but we have to monitor there very carefully about the second hit there, like embolisms, the DVTs, prophylaxis being taken, all these things are to be monitored over there. And giving back the absolute anatomy, we, we, being an orthopedic surgeon, more than anatomical, we go with them uh, biological fixations and uh, functional, there should be much of a difference in the functional outcome. That is what we look into. So that is the main agenda of the uh, uh, final fixation surgery. of uh, yes. stabilization. Yes. Yeah. So let's, uh, that's a great thing, sir. Initial assessment at ER. So what the nurses and all the emergency team will go ahead. On patient arrival to emergency, the team begins with a primary survey following trauma pathway which includes a detailed assessment of the patient. And the best chance of survival occurs when a seriously injured patient has emergency management within six hours of the injury. So this is one of the review of literature, um, like uh, we were just going through, and uh, this is a trend, uh, global changes in mort mortality rates are becoming, uh, you know, greatly good. But I think, uh, as for your opinion, sir, because the rates are decreasing because you think because of high advanced technology and skill hands. Like availability of the consultants under one roof. That is the biggest thing. That is a change yes. of what we are seeing these days. Yes. Initially, most of the things would be individualized and in, you call it as a nursing homes or individualized practice. Yes. Multi specialty involvement would be less. But these days, the multi specialty involvement, all working as a team and the evolution of the inventory with the 
what do we call the machinery is the CTs and all the timing for the scans to be very reduced and availability of the reports within no time. These are changes which has made a lot of difference and availability of all other things also like blood parameters, you call it as whatever is required is all readily available. So with that, the mortality rates has come down. Yes, it's the rehabilitation, the physio protocols and all they are cut down on their morbidity also. Yes. Over to you, Pushpa. Yes, ma'am. So now we see uh, Willow Klein was treated by Kirti, Dr. Kirti and team. So a 34-year-old uh, female presented with alleged history of four-wheeler hit to rock beside the road at around 10.30 a.m. and sustained injuries to bilateral lower limbs and right forearm. Went to, and patient, uh, they went to the nearby hospital for primary aid, later presented to us for further management. At the time of patient, we received history of loss of consciousness is present and GCS was uh, 15 by 15 and length of stay was four days. Let's, the diagnosis will be... Uh, so I think this was a diagnosis uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, done by uh, Kiti sir and team and you can just uh, go for the uh, x-rays, imaging where sir can explain this. Yes. Sir, uh, I think this was a very uh, worse of polytrauma and uh, the outcome was very good and uh, we will just share these slides. You can always give your uh, very yeah. valuable insight on the same. Yeah, in this x-ray, if you see the first x-ray, the previous one, this is type one, the post-op x-ray is been for the other uh, other one. This is for the other side. This is for the left one, the post-op x-ray is of left one. The right side, there's a simple femur shaft fracture along with the ipsilateral, same side you have the, you can go to the next slide. Yes. Same side you have the segmental tibia, wherein within a, with a single incision, we wanted to control on the soft tissue also. So with a single incision, we have did an tibia nailing as well as a retrograde femoral nailing in the same entry point. If you see from below, we have put the nail above uh, in the femur. That is what we have done in that uh, right side, uh, like tibia shaft as well as the femur. If you can go to the next slide, if you have the X-ray of the comminuted left, no, we don't have that, I guess. Yes. We should have yes. had one more X-ray when a very bad comminuted femur was there for that, which we had on the plating, which was seen on the earlier thing. And the other one was the Allah. So when we do these kind of a cases, we always assess the uh, blood parameters. Her HB was 8.7 as suggested. We went in with a uh, couple of units of blood. And as the blood loss was minimal and was there, there was no hypotension while operating and all, we went ahead and fixed all the four fractures as well as the upper limb fractures. In this scenario, if you want to uh, mix and match, like, if you want to do a couple of fractures now and then go for the next fractures and all, always prefer uh, segmental fractures or uh, thigh and leg involved on the same side. Prefer them to operate first so that you are able to mobilize them at least on one side. Yes. Lower limb fractures have to be taken as a priority compared to the upper limb fractures. And again, as an old school thought, it's an uh, open fractures versus closed fractures. Always open fractures try to stabilize. Closed fractures always give the definitive treatment. That is what we do. And luckily in this scenario, as a team, we operated uh, this patient in around three, three and a half hours for all the four fractures. Patient was stable. So we, we have finished the surgery on the same day because of which we could achieve the shortest uh, length of stay. Normally in these scenarios, patient stay for a longer time, like at least seven to 10 days kind of a thing. In this, we were able to mobilize the patient. We, we made the patient sit and all, and then discharge her on the fourth day. Length of, length of stay was only four days. Only four this days. Is what, yes. Only four days. This is what gives us happiness. Secondly, uh, there are no cross infections. Basically, the patient is motivated. The patient is not scared of it, what has happened. And patient gets motivated, being mobilized within three to four days and sending back home. That itself gives a great willpower. And it's been like, I think, two or three months now. We are making her walk on the right leg. Left side is still uh, a bit slower on the process and being on the plate. We want to delay weight bear on that. We are doing the range of movements on both the sides, and she she probably she'll be back to work in next a month or two. That is how we are looking at. The... Great to hear that she's doing very well. Now over to you, Pushpa, for the next uh, rest of the slides. As sir said, these are the surgical uh, management which is done by you, sir, and you can go to the uh, second slide. Uh, yeah. I mean the next case these presentation. Post-operative management. 
immediate post operative has sir told patient was shifted to icu and patient developed hypertension for an injection norad was supported for one day and tapered for the next day patient was mobilized bedside icu and shifted back to the room on on pod post operative day one after the patient shifted to ward and mild there is, was a saturation drop and it was picked up in the, the next day with two liters o2 pulmonologist pulmonolog opinion was taken and patient was stabilized intermittent we have given the oxygen dressing also done on the pod2 wounds were healthy during patient during hospital stay patient was treated with antibiotics analgesics has antiemetics iv fluids and other essential patient is being discharged in a stable condition has sir to this is one important okay. thing saturation being on the lower side for a polytrauma that's most expected thing yes yes as you have discussed earlier yes we should always increase them with the spirometry that is one of the most important thing most of us do resort on these things patient being on the bed increase them with the spirometry teach them whatever might be the case teach them with the spirometry it's just like pranayama you just tell them doing pranayama is nothing but let them continue doing it uh, it's not just during the stay in the hospital teach them and ask them to continue doing it it helps the lung volume to be increased and they'll have a better life even in future whenever the elderly people have an elective surgeries also your lung is good if you continue doing the spirometry exercise at home always try to teach the patients it's not just when they are in the hospital you are telling them to do it you should make sure that even after they go back home they make it as a habit and they continue it throughout their life that helps them a lot uh, this would be one of the suggestion from my end to all the sisters all the nurses over here and uh, if they are already doing it that's great and we should be thankful for them yes sir go to the next case presentation nakushma we yes. yes there is a this case also has been treated by dr kirti and team this uh, a 30 year male young boy presented with alleged history of fall from height from third floor at around 4 10 am and sustained with multiple injuries presented to us for further management at the time of when we received there was uh, no history of loss of consciousness and gcs score was good and his length of stay was 6 days so and here i can uh, see the total diagnosis uh, which is uh, you know given by you and uh, i think when uh, we were preparing the slides and reading the case history total seven major fractures the patient had and the length of stay was i think pushpa is it uh, four six. or six six, six. a day so yes. uh, go to the image uh, share the image uh, for sir to just view yeah we can see that it is the patient has been operated with the needling and sort okay on one side we can go to the next slide next slide yeah. the proximal tibia so straight forward creating what we have done next one this is a humerus where there was a segmental with uh, this thing we did an nail for this uh, patient next See, one done, done. Uh, i think yes. they have shared a few yes. exercises with you yes. there was yes. the ankles were injured we fixed a uh, both the ankles also together and along with this the humerus was injured and also the forearm forearm we did uh, tense nailing we did nailing for the forearm also so uh, it's not a definitive but patient is doing well so we didn't operate him again for a definitive plating uh, kind of a thing and he has been immobilized for uh, uh, like 4 to 6 weeks and after that we start mobilizing him and he started coming in walking to us in the Eight weeks time. This is how he has been. Even in this kind of a scenario, the patient as well as the patient family, they feel so much. Like patient was in the hospital around five thirty six in the morning, as he was really into the theater by ten thirty in the morning, and by two o'clock or three, he's he was back in the ICU. Followed by next day, one day of stay in the ICU. Next day, he was back to the room. That is what gives the confidence to the family. Because with such a polytrauma, someone falling from three-floor height with having multiple fractures, the fortunate thing in both the cases is like they didn't have major pelvic injuries, nor they didn't have the head injury. When those things are not there, your length of stay would be uh, definitely come down. And the faster you move the patient into the theater and give the quicker response about the trauma being fixed, the faster would be the rehab. The rehab. Once yeah. uh, the patient was stabilized in that way. There was a medullary injury, and even that is he, he has uh, improved over a period of time. So this is what has happened in him also. 
And in this, it's mainly not just the fixing of the things, it's the confidence that is being given to the patient as well as the patient's family. Right from the mouth of the death, next day patient sitting yes. in a bed comfortably. I don't say comfortably, but whatever has been seen the before day, if it's a drastic change what you see the next day morning, that makes themselves a lot more confident. And with that willpower, patients start doing well with the exercises and all those things. They know that they have come out of a very bad situation and whatever they're uh, facing now are very simpler things. And that is how these people are more motivated and they do really well. And compared to the simple trauma patient, if you tell about the rehabilitation calls and all, it might be hardest for the polytrauma patient, but they do really well. Probably what they have gone through that phase that makes them more stronger and they have a bigger willpower compared to the simpler ones. That's what I feel. So I think the great action. congratulation and kudos to you and your team because uh, the patient had multi-system injury and the uh, patient did very well. I think uh, sir has already spoken about this slide. You can go to 27th and uh, see the parameters. Uh, we have discussed the slides also as well in the um, early hours. Go to this 28th slides. Yeah. Yes. ma'am. Yeah. As this has also been discussed by said that airway, breathing and circulation and uh, patient uh, physiological health uh, should be restored. And the hypothermia prevention, as we know, that patient uh, uh, should be safe and you know safe enough in the ICU. Yes, next. Yeah, you can uh, say this is the trauma pathway which we follow in uh, ER setup, which consists of all Glasgow Coma Scale and uh, vital parameters and primary survey and secondary survey, which is done by uh, the team and uh, a clinical team of uh, ER and uh, orthopedics. What uh, nurses should monitor a B-bedside? Pushpa, you can speak about yes. this. So, how the AV nurses should monitor and be bedside We have to do a close observation, frequent assessment of pain, and vital signs. And most probably, most thing, the use of immobilizer, X knee, arm immobilizer, spine, borders, cervical collars, tractions, as I said, POP, and plaster cast, and splints. And we have to look for what for the bleeding side. Arranging for blood and blood products, plasma expanders, drug administrations has prescribed. We are need, as soon as possible, we need to send our blood samples and imaging scan has per order. Hemorrhagic control and hemostatic resuscitations to, to be take control. Treat shock has per the case. And let's go into the conclusion. Incidence of polytrauma is rising. Initial evaluation and stabilization is of paramount importance. Proper selection of patient for extra uh, ETC and care. DCO, early yeah. total care and uh, DCO, and the initial management of the trauma patient requires a coordinated approach by a multidisciplinary team of specialists. Yes. So having said so, so I think uh, we have done with the polytrauma cannot just uh, be run in one uh, half an hour to one hour uh, presentation. Thank you so much. But we have seen Sir uh, doing and uh, you know going for the rounds, uh, talking to the patient. Uh, the other day I could uh, witness you uh, asking the patient for this spirometry as well. You encourage all the time the nurses about the safe uh, post-operative uh, event for the patients. And uh, having said so, thank you so much, Sir, for your valuable uh, insight on the polytrauma concept. And thank you, Pushpa. That's how we end the session. Today we are ending with the orthopedic uh, series of uh, webinar. And uh, next month, we will be starting the uh, endovascular uh, series. So stay connected, everyone. Thank you so much and uh, goodbye. Thank you.